extremism in enabling environments, um, with, which will entertain the, the main question why local resilience is more robust than we think, um, and how we can go about supporting it. My name is Stephen Wilkins, I'm the Director of Research here at, uh, at SEPS. It's my welcome, it's my pleasure to, to welcome you to, uh, to this panel discussion here at the SEPS Ideas Lab, um, and to welcome in particular um, fellow travelers in the Horizon 2020 Commission funded um, Fairfax project uh, with its um, Principal investigator Martin Burns, who is a research professor at uh, NUPI and works predominantly on issues concerning peace and conflict in Africa. Um, and um, on my right hand side, Indina Vicinovic, um, professor at the faculty of criminal justice, criminology, and security studies at the University of Sarajevo and uh, co founder of the Atlantic Initiative. Uh, Center for Security and Justice Research in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, both have uh, done extensive work on um, the prevention of violent extremism, uh, countering violent extremism in, in the regions they know best. Um, I will dispense from doing a tour of the at the moment, but would certainly want to invite you during the discussion to state your name and affiliation. Uh, when uh, when you come in, um, so you know we have some firepower in the, in the room, uh, also from the, uh, the EU institutions here uh, in Brussels. And I think it's fair to say that um, at this stage of the research being conducted in the Prevex project, we've done our desktop research as to what uh, European policies look like. And we know, of course, that. Um, this has had a long gestation period within the European Union itself, where several member states have developed their own strategies, uh, their own institutional frameworks in order to deal primarily with homegrown violism and, and radicalization. Um, countries, you know, from Italy to, to Ireland and the UK, of course, France and Spain, also more recently having been faced with, uh, in particular, um, the threat of, um, of, of terrorist uh, attacks, and uh, which have, um, in that sense, developed their own doctrinal approaches also, where I think it would be fair to say there is no common understanding or no granular common understanding at EU level uh, what PPE really entails. Um, what, for example, the face of, of religion is um, in, in this approach, uh, and how it uh, how it connects with the scope of the freedom um, uh, to religion. To just take one example, um, we know, of course, that uh, there's a tendency uh, among politicians to um, to drive the religious aspect quite uh, quite hard and to focus it primarily. On, on violent um, extremism uh, of Islam. This is by no means um, the, the straight jacket in which we have approached uh, the topic in uh, the project. Um, on the basis of our desktop research, our teams have ventured out into the field, conducted quite extensive field research in areas as broad as uh, from Mali and uh, the wider Sahel region over Libya into uh, the Middle East to Iraq, but also uh, the Western Balkans. And what we'd like to present to you today is at least some of the feedback loops um, from, that, uh, from that field research. Uh, with Morton kicking us off, um, I think with some, with some more general uh, comments, which in a regional sense pertain mostly to the MENA, the wider MENA region, and Edina uh, then focusing uh, a bit more uh, specifically on, on the Western Balkans and in particular Bosnia Herzegovina and, uh, and Serbia. Um, so, with that introduction, I'll hand it over to, to Morton. I would like this to be an interactive session after uh, their presentations. So, certainly, if the responses or the questions don't come, Reach out to you. Oh, more towards yours. 
Thank you, Stephen. And uh, thanks for hosting us here at the Southside East Lab. Uh, great to be back here. Um, and uh, I look forward to this session and I look forward to the rest of the day as well. Um, obviously, I mean, we all know the kind of terrible toll that uh, violent extremism has taken around the world. Uh, and that the violent extremism creates uh, disasters, instability, and death, suffering. I mean, that's uh, not of a debate at all. And obviously, I mean, since the, in fact, since uh, the 11th September attacks uh, many uh, decades back, I mean, there has been a huge focus in the research and policy on radicalization, on the occurrence of radicalization and on the occurrence of violent extremism. And while this research and these policies have been transmitted and has given us much insight, they have, they have also, in a way, created a blind zone because the literature, but also the parts of most of the policy has been, I would say, almost obsessed with the occurrence of this phenomenon. And this is partly a problem, and, and it's also a problem for uh, preventive efforts. Why is that the case? It's the case because even in the most enabling environment, and by an enabling environment, we simply mean environments where you have all the factors that we know from the literature that is supposed to enable violent extremism, to enable radicalism. Even in these areas, where people have not only perceived grievances, but extremely real grievances. I mean, I work in, I, uh, most of my empirical work is done in, uh, in the Sahel countries, where young people have hundreds, if not more, reasons for being angry. But the overall majority do not join these movements. Neither do, are they attracted by them. They see in, the, in various ways, both young and elder people, male and female, they try in various ways to resist. Some openly, but uh, in many, many of these places, I mean, if you live in an area infested by armed insurgents with a radical ideology, I mean, open resistance can be extremely dangerous. So in most cases, we all see other and more subtle forms of resistance. We have, we, have docu we have documented this in Mali, we have documented this in Museum, uh, but we also have similar stories from the work that uh, our colleagues have shown in Iraq and Syria, where people, even people, I mean, Mosul, for example, yes, I mean, it was completely sort of occupied, dominated by the Islamic State, but I mean, people tried to do most people tried to do two things, one is sort of to simply stay alive, go about their daily life, but also they have so what there are well documented these pathways of both open but also subtle resistance. So I think this is some this has great uh, we need to focus more on the cases of non-occurrence. Why people do not join, even if according to theory, they, they live in one of the most enabling environments in the world. And they have tons of grievances and Many, many good reasons for being there. But still, they do not try. Uh, and in the case of Mali and this area, you also have very, very solid data. And I'll ask my colleague, uh, not my colleague, uh, Abdul Wahab Sisei, who's sitting uh, over there, to come in a little later on this data uh, when we are in the discussion phase on, on this data. But this data shows that. When we ask people, and this is based both on politics and use and service, when we ask people why people they know have joined some of these armed Islamic movements, because here we are talking about uh, Islamic uh, extremism. Uh, very few people say that it was due to their religious belief. They say that they had a lack of employment, all the land rights issues, all the stereotyping of the state, these kind of things where I mean, the states come in with extremely heavy handed approaches. Uh, for example, uh, this uh, what we see in parts of the Sahel where the Fulani is seen as basically the, 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 the a Fulani equals a jihadi. I mean, this is, it's of course, extremely dangerous. I mean, what happened 
you may have heard about the massacre in Nomura, I mean, what happened there was probably based on some extremely stupid stereotyping of the jihadi. Because these people were living in a jihadi um, occupied area that was the sort of liberated by the Mali army. And they seemed to be going after people with beards and uh, ankles uh, cut short trousers. And of course, people were uh, looking like they had it because they were living in an area occupied by the jihadi, uh, the where the jihadi had implemented these kind of street dress codes and bear codes, basically. And then you wondered why some Fulanis that thereafter joined the armed insurgencies. So we need to focus more on the non terrorist side. We need to understand better why people do not join. And we believe that this could be quite game changing because it's an other way of, of thinking about preventive uh, prevention. It's a way of thinking about prevent, uh, prevention where you try to do something before people are radicalized instead of these kind of de radicalization uh, programs that they're extremely costly and the effectiveness of them can, at least in certain cases, clearly be questioned. We know this, for, uh, we have not looked at Somalia because it was not part of. Uh, uh, it's not part of the project nor uh, part of the form, but if you look at the data on the, from uh, what has been done of research on de-radicalization programs in Somalia, that has cost a lot of money, uh, the effects are uh, at least can be questioned. So why not instead sort of change the focus to the majority of people who are not at least at the onset interested in this at all, but rather try to resist. And then, it, uh, then the question becomes, I mean, what should we then be looking at? And what we see from our data that we are now anal busy analyzing both sort of on a case study level, but also starting to draw uh, sort of certain conclusions between the various regions that we have worked with. Because we have data from, from the Sahel countries, we have data from some of the North African countries like uh, Morocco, Tunisia, and, and Libya. And then we have data from uh, Middle East countries. We have data from uh, Egypt, uh, Iraq, Syria, and, uh, and Jordan. I mean, religious leaders and community leaders are extremely important. And to bring them on board. And this, uh, again, I will talk about some of the same, same things uh, from uh, Bosnia and Serbia. Religious leaders, many finding ways of bringing them on board. Also, but this also means that we need to bring a board and work with religious leaders that may have some agendas that do not necessarily fit that well with all sort of Western liberal values. Some of the most important guardians of resilience can also be found within very socially conservative and more religious environments. They, even in the Salafi and Wahhabi congregations, they find these kind of guardians of resilience. They may have a theological view that we do not appreciate very much. They may also have certain what we would call non liberal values, but they are still are important guardians of resilience against violent extremism. And it's these people that we need to become better at working with. We, we cannot only look at uh, look at and want to work with those that think exactly the same that like we do. We need to find also, of course, when you say strange bedfellows at times, because we have common interest, common interest in uh, guarding against violent extremism. So religious leaders, but also lineage-based leaders can be immensely important. And you see that from our data. Lineage leaders that are sort of managed to stay respected in the communities and have respect not only among their peers in the in the other ruling lineages but also have respect among uh, what we may call dependent lineages and uh, particularly among youth from dependent lineages extremely <coughs> important and sort of finding the sort of subtle ways of supporting these guardians of uh, uh, of resilience local but this needs to be very subtle because what we know is that if the EU or another external actors come in with full force, flags up, patting, patting these people on the back, we are, we are still the opposite. 
So this, what this means is that these kinds of operators need to be extremely light suited. So what do you mean by lineage leaders? Uh, what are we talking yeah. about? Oh, sorry. Uh, lineage leaders, then you're talking, I mean, family lineages, the important families in the, in the local communities. Ah, sure. And most of these communities are very separated. I mean, you can go into one of these communities, be it in a desolate part of Iraq, or be it in, a, in a rural areas in Mali, Sahel, uh, somewhere, and you may look at these communities and think that everybody, they are equally poor, all of them. They may look like that, but then uh, most of these uh, local communities, be it uh, in parts of the MENA or in parts of the Sahel, they are immensely stratified economically, socially, politically, uh, immensely stratified. And the stratification is often based on this between the ruling lineages or the ruling family lines and what is what we call dependent family lines. And most often these traditional authorities, they will belong to the ruling family lines. And then the question is, if they can take on this role as guardians or of resilience, it depends on the degree to which they are also respected and trusted among those that uh, comes from the dependent, the poor religious, those with less power. Because if not, if they don't have that respect, that creates sort of a possible pathway in for, for example, the jihadi activists to start mobilizing. Intermarriages is also immensely important. Not something that is easily supported by an external actor, but looking at the marriage patterns, to what degree do people marry between communities? Because if you have this, have some sort of interaction between different communities, also on a social family level, it, it's more difficult for somebody who would like to gain traction with some sort of violent ideology to utilize grievances between communities. So looking at these kind of functional ties that last between groups and how one could sort of further develop these, uh, these kind of functional ties, or in the cases where they have been broken, which is the case of so much of the Sahel, looking at ways in which external intervention can help repairing some of these functional ties. Here I'm thinking particularly about the issue which you see as a main sort of drive of why violent extremist actors get traction in the Sahel, and that is land rights issues, and particularly the relationship between the herders and uh, farmers. And what can be done in order to try to repair some of these relationships? Because what we know historically, right now, for example, in Mali, the, the relationship between the, the Fulani, which are herders, and the Dogo people, which are mainly uh, farmers that also have some cattle, has reached a historically long level. This is an old complicated relationship of both uh, animosity, but also periods of friendship and cooperation between them. What can both, what, what can external actors achieve in these kinds of cases? I think it's possible to do certain things, to look at, uh, for instance, some of these land rights issues, look at how is there some cost efficient ways that we can help to create a more communal cooperative atmosphere between two groups that live together and have to share the same resources, but have very different functional interests concerning how that shared resource should be used. We are here talking about land and water. And land and water is something that we can do something about. So we have all of these kind of things. Uh, I'll stop very soon, uh, but I think it's important also to at least pay a little bit of attention to the role of the state. And that the states here are often difficult. Why is that the case? It's the case because often, unfortunately, the, the, the approaches of states in, in these parts of the world tend to aggregate rather than reduce social tensions. Still, we cannot work around the resources. We need to find ways of engaging with them, even if they may be as problematic as, for example, the relationship that is right now between uh, Mali and, uh, and uh, France and thereby also the European Union. We need to find a way of engaging with it. 
And we also need to become better at sort of seeing how local communities relate to or rather try to attempt to escape the state. So the state is also something that we need to factor in and find, try to find various pathways of working with and influencing. It may be that parts of these uh, states, they only aggregate tensions, but there may be other parts of these states that in fact can have some cooperative uh, efforts. Here. And that, of course, needs to be uh, done on a case by case basis, but we need to do that. So, how can we support local communities? To be very general about this, I mean, we need to have, of course, a do no harm approach because we are talking here about extremely fragile environments. And the last thing we should do is to make things even worse for these local communities. That means that we need to have an approach that is context and conflict sensitive. We have to understand how external stakeholders and interventions are perceived and received locally. Are we seen as effective and, leg and legitimate, or are we simply seen as irrelevant or counterproductive? And if we are seen as the latter, we need to do something about it. We cannot just say that we are doing good. You, you don't. You just misunderstand us. We need to engage with this. That's also why I think that, uh, on a sort of branding level, the EU <coughs> places where they have got a very serious problems. No sort of, for example, this anti French rhetoric, just saying that these are stupid people who uh, doesn't understand what they're doing. That is not helpful. We need to find a way of engaging and understanding why this has happened, rather than just saying, oh, this is hopeless, we cannot do anything with these stupid people. Be light footed. We need to have close monitoring and analysis that informs programming about how to support actors that are the local guardians of resilience. We need to support them without making them the agents of externally driven PCVE efforts. And that is immensely important that we, in our attempt to support people, don't make them the agents of something that is externally driven. That's why we need to be so light to almost invisible in that regard. And of course, such an approach cannot be risk averse, but it needs to be risk realistic. And if you allow me to a second, Stephen, I just want to end by saying that, of course, no, I mean, we are all looking at what is happening in Ukraine and the war in Ukraine, and that's understandable. But we need to realize that other fires could start burning soon. And the reason why is that the costs of the sanctions, which I'm truly in support of, so that's not the issue, but the cost of these sanctions are not only being paid by people who get higher petrol prices in Europe, they are also being paid by some of the most vulnerable poor communities in the world. Because if it's a problem for a European family to pay the electricity bill, gas bill, or the, or the price at the, at the pump for the petrol, the cost of living is ri rising tremendously also in parts of the Sahel and the Mena. And <coughs> Fertilizer is something that most people can just forget about artificial fertilizers because it is so immensely expensive. And who will benefit from this? That's the agents of violent groups who will benefit from this. And we need to be prepared that new fires can blow up any day now. And we should do something with this before it really starts burning. However, Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Martin, also for that final point to trade off uh, across EU foreign policy uh, lines of course, and, and regions. Um, switching, therefore, to another region, mm -hmm. um, the Balkans. Uh, Ina, continue your thoughts. Um, I, hello, everybody, first of all. Um, I usually start these kind of meetings when Bosnia is on the agenda. Um, with some really gloomy predictions and uh, assessments of security situations in, in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And I have usually reasons for that now, uh, given that I am a uh, Bosnian researcher researching mainly the situation in Bosnia and the region uh, in, the, in, in the Western Balkans. I can't be realistic as it's through the rosy glasses. Um, and I will certainly talk about these uh, security challenges, especially after 
um, couple of present and, and um, former NATO, EU and US officials have told us about some intelligence um, uh, findings uh, that Russia has an interest in destabilizing Bosnia and that you know this destabilization this, this possibly leading to a more serious conflict. Some of those intelligence sources um, say it could uh, happen soon. So that's an unavoidable topic, and especially thinking that if they were right uh, uh, about uh, Ukraine, uh, would we have no, it would be responsible to uh, neglect that now. But before I get to those new predictions, I'd like to offer some positive examples from our research, which show that despite all the negatives surrounded and, and negative image uh, surrounding my, my country, there is still hope for Bosnia. Uh, in the field work we conducted uh, last summer, but we also continued um, uh, doing, doing a, a certain update and we get informed about what the situation uh, locally. Atlantic Initiative researchers found that majority uh, youth in Bosnia and Herzegovina rejects ethnic segregation, rejects radicalization, and uh, they reject prevailing politics um, of the division. And it's not really easy for them to reject that, taking all the pressures coming from the uh, mainstream uh, political level, from uh, locally, ethnically divided institutions. But still, it's really encouraging uh, to see that, uh, that, that they do. I'll give you some very concrete uh, examples, uh, places that I've visited as well with the Atlantic Initiative researchers. Let's talk about, uh, look, look at the town of Stots. Um, it lies south of Moscow and it has a Bosnian Croat Catholic majority on the level of municipalities, even though Bosnia, uh, Bosnian Muslims are majority in, 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 in its central town. Um, so the Bosnian Croat Ethno Nationalist Party, the HDZ, they dominate the municipality administration. And Stolac is remarkably ethnically divided. Now, the institutions have done everything in their power to ethically divide thoughts. So, the majority Bosnia Catholic, and then majority um, Croat uh, Catholic. Uh, they divided even hospitals, um, schools. So, it all does reflect in a um, social distance between older Bosniaks or older generations of Bosniaks um, and, and, and Croats. Yet, it's encouraging that um, while in the first couple of uh, post-war uh, years, there were frequent examples of, of uh, hate crimes and violent incidents that wasn't really uncommon. In the past couple of years, these things are uh, not happening. Tensions have uh, calmed. And uh, there's been no cases of uh, inter ethnic violence. So, when we were talking with people from Stolac, uh, we were interviewing them, it's like the wartime history is still there. Uh, uh, Bosniaks were the primarily uh, victims, um, and, and, and this, this, let's kind of enter their uh, daily narratives, or maybe. When the visitors come, when, when somebody is interviewing them, they feel obliged to uh, share share those stories. Um, there is no Salafist in Stola, so that kind of extremist uh, 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 narrative didn't really take root in in in, in Stola at all, despite the fact that Bosniaks are on the institutional level very much uh, discriminated because of uh, Bosnian Croats, they hold the majority, um, they hold majority uh, in, in the municipality population. But younger people seem to resist 
those divisions in society. It's, it appears that they are really tired of those, of those uh, divisions. They engage across ethnic lines through social and sports activities. Um, we found that sports is a very important factor course, that encourages, of course, bringing, um, bringing people of different ethnicities and religions together. That is a very important factor of Brazilians <coughs> to extremism and uh, radicalization. Um, there is this East Club basketball team. That is, it's, it's, um, its establishment and certain support comes from foreign Western funding, but the municipal administration, majority corrupt administration, discourages uh, that and even charges them for um, renting the, um, uh, the facilities for training, despite the fact that those facilities were financed again by Western donations. So these are some of the paradoxes that I guess with donors intervention could be actually um, could be actually sold. So the international funding also supports a brass band installers that includes youth from all ethnic groups. And in almost um, uh, 20 years that, that, that this uh, uh, orchestra exists, the municipality set aside only 500 euros for its activities, but the rest of the funding actually comes from the from the from the uh, US embassy. It's interesting how those parallel realities exist in Stalin. We have young people um, communicating, even um, uh, dating uh, across ethnic lines. Uh, they travel together, um, and this in 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 so many ways actually reflect that so many young Bosnians across the countries which we encountered and, and, and interviewed during this research and focus on other municipalities, it seems that they are ready to embrace this idea of the, of the uh, Bosnian unity and to reject the ethnic polit politics uh, of the past. But it's difficult for them. It's difficult because uh, usually, those uh, ethnically oriented, I'm, not, I'm, really, I'm talking now about you know local communities, ethnically oriented um, um, ad local administrations are, for example, very much in um, intertwined with uh, 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 connected with with uh, local church in um, Stolats, uh, for example, Catholic priests agitated against the orchestra on a Sunday uh, mass, according to our interviews. He goes so far to when he finds out that the young Bosnian Croat or, or and, and uh, Bosnian people um, are uh, communicating or uh, dating, he calls out the name of their parents, warning them in front of everybody in, in, in sessions that are called public shaming. Um, at the same time, the interreligious, the Catholic Church is involved in the interreligious council, but consciously chooses uh, uh, priests that are extreme in their narratives that know that they will spread radicalization among their adherents to those sensitive areas. So they're actually playing the double game. Uh, in the Interreligious Council, presenting their cooperative move tolerance, um, uh, uh, multi religious tolerance uh, narrative. And in local communities, they uh, 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 choose um, priests that spread uh, extremism. I think it, the time has come when the Catholic Church, as well as the Orthodox Church, should be uh, um, confronted with their local politics, not just uh, uh, programming on the, um, you know, and, and 
anti-speeches that they do not really translate well in, in the local politics. So another positive example of interactive tolerance is the town of Trebinje, with majority uh, Serbs in Republika Srpska. Frankly speaking, Bosniak uh, uh, are, are, are really a minority in Trebinje, but still interviews told us told our researchers that interactive relations there are so tolerant that even football hooligans are not hooligans like in other uh, parts of the countries um, because we, we have this kind of problem, I mean, worldwide problems, I guess, I guess with the, with the, with the, with the football uh, hooligans. Hooligan. Uh, also, in, in Trebinje, there is a nationalist organization, Ramogorski Chetnički Pokret. Uh, that's an organization with fascist um, leaning honors, and they publicly honor memories of Serb war criminals like Radovan Karadžić, Radko Mladić, and from the Second World War, Draža Mihailović. They simply see themselves as a military arm of the Serb separatist movement for them. Wars of the 1990s have never finished. They were merely interrupted and were just waiting for the chance to um, uh, start again or to finish off, um, as, as, as uh, uh, some of them proclaimed the genocide that they, 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 they started. It's really promising that we find out that the youth in Trebinje, uh, Bosnian Serb Orthodox youth in Trebinje, uh, seems to be rejecting the movement locally. They don't go, they refuse to go um, to their uh, gathering. One important finding also is that um, uh, quite a few uh, uh, Serbs in, 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 in Trebinje said that they strongly believe that the education in Bosnia uh, must change. Um, they told researchers that their children are being indoctrinated in school um, to be disloyal to the states of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, and um, I, I'll, I'll, be, I'll, I'll tell you a quote, like children must be taught that the Republika Srpska is only an entity, not a state, that it is part of the state of Bosnia. Um, they also suggested, uh, one, of, one of the interviews said it would be useful to have regular excursions so that children could learn about other places and people. And also they said that the policies of the past must change because they maintain extremist uh, narrative. Unfortunately, extremist narratives were clearly on display just um, a couple of weeks ago in Trebinje uh, at the gathering in support of Russia, uh, where municipal uh, uh, officials wore t shirts with the Z uh, uh, sign on it. So, this uh, again brings us to the discrepancy between the official politics and political speech. Um, and the mundane life of Bosnia, the day-to-day -day communication between the people and the cooperation between businesses where really ethnicity um, does not matter. But the official politics does matter. It's important to have projects like those in, in, in Tolat. Um, it's important to support uh, areas uh, like uh, Trebinje, which is a uh, tourist town, uh, uh, prosper economically uh, because of the tourism, and for them, simply, it's not profitable to be um, an extremist, but it, in the end, is the political leaders that will determine the fate of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. So when it comes to whether to start the conflict, the war or not, the uh, local population is not uh, absolutely cons consulted. We know that from the past, people are just being uh, uh, recruited. Um, unfortunately, despite this positive note, I would say that 
there is a possibility of the wider violent conflict in, 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 in Bosnia. If the Bosnian Serb leader who was part, who has who really has uh, started the secession of Republika Srpska, if he continues with his plans and if his plans have not been stopped, um, because he already started creating Serb only parallel institutions like the Bosnian Serbs did in, 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 in the 1990s, um, including the police uh, and the military. If he continues to do so, and the Moscow has hinted that they will encourage him to do so, um, that simply cannot be done without the violent conflict. Um, unfortunately, Moscow has diversified its allies uh, in Bosnia. So they're very supportive of um, uh, the, uh, uh, the creation of the third entity, Bosnian Croat third entity, and further um, ethnic uh, division of Bosnia and Herzegovina. They are, you know, we have um, neighboring states, Serbia and uh, uh, Croatia using um, Bosnian Serbs and Bosnian Croats in the same manner um, that uh, Putin uh, uh, has, has, uh, has used Russians in Ukraine. So unfortunately, in many ways, parallels can be drawn between um, uh, the behavior of Serbia and to certain extent, uh, Croatia, um, and their attitude towards Bosnia, not, not recognizing the Bosnian state. Uh, um, similar politics as the, as the Putin had towards Ukraine. I think that rhetoric should not be underestimated. Thank you very much, uh, Idina. And yet we come again to Ukraine at the very end <laughs> of uh, your story as well. Um, there's a couple of takeaway, uh, takeaways um, for me, at least from, from your story. Um, you, you focused on, on some positive examples, but the threat is always around the corner, uh, essentially. Um, I was struck by well, if one looks at it from, from an EU uh, approach, especially a member state, Croatia, of course, uh, playing uh, its own widgets in, in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, which, which, is, uh, which is complicating perhaps an EU wide approach uh, to these issues. Uh, in support, uh, your, your story about Stolax, um, which seems to be focusing on the wrong. Um, uh, extremists. Uh, you, you mentioned basically there's hardly any salafists around, uh, whereas the donor intervention seems to be predicated on, uh, on getting rid of that supposed uh, threat, whereas Catholic and maybe also Orthodox uh, Church um, uh, go unchecked. Um, I may be exaggerating, but, uh, but these are some of the issues that I, that I picked up from from your, I mean, your, the underlying current is really, uh, of course, that uh, official politics matter a lot and are a problem. This is something that resonates very um, heavily also with, uh, with what Morton has, uh, has mentioned. Um, and then the positive spin that you uh, gave us with, uh, and it's on it's basically to try and identify those, um, those corporate developments, of course, on a case by case basis. Okay, these are some um, of the findings from, uh, from the Quebec's uh, field research. Uh, it was good to hear um, in, a, in a balanced way, um, you know, both threats, but also opportunities that, uh, that Ryan had in recalibrating the EU's own PPE, CBP um, approaches. I'll be keen to, to bring in uh, the audience, so perhaps you have any questions, but also any observations. Um, particularly, of course, from uh, from the EU institutions themselves, Commission, uh, European Action Service. Um, so, floor is open. Uh, and if you don't come, I will address it. Please, please, yes. Please state your name and uh, My name is Mike Bake. I work for um, the consultancy Acuris. 
in the area of security and justice. Thank you very much for these, uh, this presentation, very interesting. Um, I was wondering, and I'm not sure if, if I'm, uh, if you're already allowed to, to be talking about uh, uh, this because you've been focusing on regions outside of the EU. But if you look at these, uh, these very good examples you've been giving, uh, giving of uh, robust um, um, local resilience no, to extremism, are there lessons that you can draw when looking at um, the EU itself? Do you see similar kind of uh, local resilience or do you see areas that are recognizable when you look at this, uh, this issue here uh, within EU member states? We live in Brussels, um, where Mordenbeek is, of course, been <laughs> uh, a municipality that has been held up uh, as both a problem but also part of a solution. Um, where I think at very local level, um, you know, new new attempts have been made at, uh, at integrating uh, people and helping them with um, communal policing, but uh, at, the, at the security side of it, but of course, in much more integrative. Programs, um, both through uh, mosques uh, as well as through sports organizations, uh, local cleanup actions, uh, what have you. So th this goes quite uh, quite deep, and of course, has been a shock uh, as um, as this municipality has been singled out, um, especially as being a hotbed uh, of, uh, of uh, radicalization. Uh, that has spurred uh, some of the some of the terrorists uh, that, uh, that were active in, uh, in Paris. This is just one example. I'm sure that there's many other that uh, can be shared from uh, from across uh, the room. Uh, but I'd be keen again to uh, to reach out to you and to, to come out with uh, the questions or observations you may have had on the basis of these uh, two presentations. Please. Yeah, uh, Richard Bertrand with the Boost Institute here in Brussels, working on the EU. Health Affairs, and I'm also with the UN University in Bruges. I guess almost going on from the question, in many respects, is more than a point on local guardians. Absolutely, um, key roles we play. But also in the research you were talking about as well, there seems to be some slightly problematic um, ideas. I'm just curious how you see them coming together. Definitely light-footed, but also at the same time, some of these local guardians may not be some of the best actors we want to be associated with. So if you're light-footed, you're relying on local guardians, essentially, how can we ensure these local guardians are telling us, telling the external actors, excuse me, the right story? I'll give you one quick example out of Afghanistan. External actor wanted to build a well and a water supply system. The engineers came in, said, here are the villages, they'll get supplied. Light-footed, they asked the local leaders what they were told were the local leaders. They say, yep, these are our villages. Go ahead and build it. It was built. Big ceremony. Water gets turned on. Conflict breaks up the next day. I said, why? I said, well, we believe the local leaders, and they didn't tell us there's another leader over there that they don't like. So they were light-footed, and essentially they were, I want to choose, but they were brought into a local conflict. So how do we sort of, in the long-term processes, bring these different things together in a constructive way without getting heavy-handed and interventionist? Yeah, I kind of, I, I want to respond a little bit to this. So sorry, my name is Kira Murphy. I currently work with European Integration for an Irish National Contact Fund, but I was working uh, for the last few years with GSER, the Global Community Engagement and Resilience Fund, to fund basically local actors in preventing radicalism. Um, and we work very closely with local NGOs. And the approach that we took, we were told consistently, was much better than any other approach because we essentially asked local actors, you tell us what you need. We'll give you the funding for three, six years. You tell us your priority. And I think there's a real danger in all external action that tries to go in, understand conflict dynamics, understand the proper gatekeepers, understand, because there's already people there who understand those things. And I think research like this is so important for us to try to understand, but I think there's a real danger in extrapolating and saying, okay, we've identified this key. And what we really see happening is when we move from research to solutions, is then somebody in Brussels writes, okay, we found all of these uh, conflict dynamics, and here's the project that we think is going to uh, 
solve all these problems. And then you contract a local person who understands the problems way better than we ever will to implement the solutions. And they're, they know that they're not going to work. The local communities know that they're not going to work. But that's how the dynamics have worked. And it's how it works in general in developments and funding. And I think this is a real issue when we, when we do amazing research like this, but then we try to impose the findings on someone who could have told us that five years ago. But I didn't know that the earlier point that was made in Moulin Bedford across Europe, we talked to local community leaders, and again, we were told everybody wants the non liberal understanding that is our, our identity. So you have to listen to us or walk away. But then you got to find much more nuanced, granular ideas, education being key, and working in that way. So absolutely. What do you want to comment on this? Yes. Uh, um, this is what you point out is, of course, clearly, and that's also why I said that. Uh, I mean, if you want to try to rethink parts of what we have been doing here in a slightly different way, we cannot be risk averse, but we need to be risk realistic. And in order to achieve this, I mean. I understand your point of view, but I mean, I also have learned, I mean, from my various work in, uh, in the Sahel and elsewhere. I mean, local, but it's not only a local, but I mean, they also have, a, there is a, so many local conflicts and so, so much that is going on local. I mean, trying to understand, for instance, I mean, complexity of land rights issues in a place like Mali in the in the inner Delta. I mean, I, I know. Pretty much a good deal about it. Abdul knows even more, but none of us know everything about it. And neither should we ever uh, think that we will know everything about it. But we can know something about it. That means that I think that you still need, in order to be able to do this, you need uh, either the institution themselves need to have that proper analytical competence, which, because I mean, the, the Afghanistan example, I mean, Somebody who really knew that area could have could have been avoided. So many of these things that happen so unintentionally can be avoided with <coughs> proper analytical competence and, and analytical competence and skill that is mainstream through the through the institutions involved. So it's possible to avoid it, but uh, again, I mean, it will always be a risk. There will be risks, but there is risks also in what we are doing now. So I mean, uh, and I think that we, I and when I look at parts of what we are trying to do, in particular, but the, I had a, not, the EU is not the only one that is guilty. It's most of the large international donors, right? but they have become immensely discovered. And the more sort of conflict affected uh, an area is, the more I mean, the international institutions present on the ground, they live in their own bubble, whether it's a Kabul bubble or a Bamako bubble or uh, whatever kind of bubble it is. And I mean, we have, and something that I think is astonishingly, and something that we have uh, with our uh, colleagues in uh, Mali and Stella and Sahel has uh, discovered uh, and experienced so many times is that. When we work together, I mean, it's of course much easier for my colleagues on the ground to, uh, to you know, to set up meetings with local partners that we want to talk to these kind of things. But to get for us to get meetings with uh, with the international community actors like the EU, I have to do it. It's so difficult for local researchers to get access to the people who are on the ground supposedly to help them. There is something that has happened here that uh, is mind boggling, and we need to do something about it. But the risk will always be there, but we can we can be, become more risk realistic in our assessment, but we should be aware of becoming too risk averse. And yeah, so I mean, there, there is no sort of easy way out of it, but we can become, we can be better. Do we want to come in on this? Yeah. Um, thank you for uh, inviting you briefly me. Briefly, state your name and the year. Yeah. My name is Abdul Wahab Sise. So I work for ARGA, it's, uh, the Alliance for Rebuilding Governance in Africa. So we are based in Qatar, but we have offices in Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso. 
uh, I want to just uh, dig into what uh, Morton was just saying about how uh, like local researchers have sometimes problem to access uh, some of the agency, uh, uh, development agency, or uh, let's say uh, the EU, etc. It's a big problem. And uh, one other problem is also, for example, regarding uh, funding. We, we are talking about having a life footprint. So it means that, for example, we have like grassroots organization at the local level who know exactly what's going on, what, uh, how to implement or how to design project and how to implement. But the problem is sometimes they are facing like a, a big kind of bureaucracy to access funding and also reporting is, is very he a heavy burden on them. And they don't even sometimes have the skill to do that. So I think this is something that needs to be addressed too. Um, on, on, on the possible council world. Most of it is the Sarajevo-based organization, but we do research throughout Bosnia uh, and in a couple of ways. We cooperate with local organizations. We also have independently of those local organizations for the areas that we found find really very uh, important uh, to research uh, and, and, and vulnerable. Uh, we have usually um, uh, another local researcher who is not involved in, the, uh, in that local organization. And then on the top of it, we also, when we do research, we also go from Sarajevo to the field uh, and additionally do research. So it's important to do checking and to look at it from uh, different sides. But then we do a very, um, we have usually time for our research and we've been really lucky with funding. That's something that we um, can plan in, you know, with the budget, those are not one off visits in and out of certain town, talking to you know, certain organizations and then get it out. We really get time to um, have, a, have, a, have, a, have a, a proper picture. Because for me, uh, from Sarajevo, one would expect that in talking to, for example, to Bosnians in Priedor who are the minority and discriminated by the Bosnian Serbs and the Bosnian administration, one would imagine that I would be welcome in theater. But Bosniaks actually feel really um, abandoned by the central government. So for them, you know, um, similar ethnicity with the researcher is actually disadvantaged. So, it's really knowing the context, and they would they would much better accept uh, uh, researchers who are not from from Sarajevo than those than those who are. So you know those local um, circumstances, social dynamics that they really need to be taken into account. The research is one thing, implementation is another. Yeah. <laughs> this is where where you went. Yeah. Uh, I'm keen uh, to, to bring in uh, the European Action Service first, but if you could introduce yourself. Yes, um, still good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Lita Zapancic. I work for the External uh, Action Service uh, and uh, I recently joined the, the Council of Terrorism uh, Division. Uh, happy to be here and, and many thanks for, for extending your invitation and also to, to both of the speakers for, for your uh, presentations. I think it really gives us uh, a lot of food for thought, very interesting and deep. And thanks for that. If I may zoom out a bit, I mean, we have been discussing this. Uh, I, 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 to be completely open, I, I joined the team this January, uh, but I've noticed that this topic is, is really, I would say, gaining uh, prominence not only within the institutions, but also with the member states, because I'm also privileged uh, enough to, 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 to join and sit in with, with, the, with the working group at the council that, that deals with this. So uh, I also uh, still am quite <coughs> in contact with the member states. 
uh, and also during the French presidency, this was this was very important in the public, especially of course also uh, Sahel, but also uh, the Western Balkans. Uh, and of course, the 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 notion is that this violent extremism is is, is of course growing world, worldwide, as you pointed out, exacerbated by you know technological advances, uh, disinformation, political, economic, even health crisis, and now. Of course, also with the sanctions and, and the trade off, as you mentioned. But also, of course, there's just the influence of, of third parties, and especially, for instance, the Sahel, uh, you know, Russia and Wagner, and of course, Western Balkans is also very vulnerable to that. And maybe I would, would ask both of you if you could maybe elaborate on that a bit. The, the second point is, mm, of course, research also shows that. Uh, there are transnational links between these two these violent uh, uh, individuals and groups uh, around the world, notably but not exclusively, of course, uh, through online uh, contacts. Uh, and also due to this growing online connectivity, um, the EES and, and the European Union in, in general uh, is now trying to strengthen, of course, bilateral and multilateral efforts. Um, uh, as outlined in our toolbox, and with our toolbox, I mean, you know, the, the multilateral uh, platforms that we are uh, a part of, especially now we have successfully uh, went to a, a bit to co chair the GCPF, and of course, they are also in a very important uh, GCPF inspired institutions that we finance, especially uh, representatives are here, so I think that's very important as well. Uh, there are also our CT experts on the ground who are. Uh, keen also uh, on, on this issue, and I couldn't uh, agree more with what you said uh, when it comes to prevention. I think this is this is really important, and this is also something uh, that, that the European Union is, is very uh, aware of. And I think the majority of our funding goes actually into prevention, uh, because we of course we understand that the, the prevention is, is is yeah again I will be blunt cheaper than 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 uh, than the remedies. Um, one, one last final point on the Western Balkans. Uh, I, I've been dealing with it for the last three years and a half, and especially, I'm sorry to say, when it comes to Bosnia, I'm still really puzzled because it's such a complex environment, and, and I understand uh, a bit beneath the complexities. And I think the problem, of course, is on a local level, but of course also in a, on a state level with, with the politicians fueling these sentiments. And this is, 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 is a real struggle. And for the Western Balkans, we have a, a very good framework, which is called the Joint Action Plan for the Western Balkans countries. Each of these six uh, partners, Western Balkans partners, has its own bilateral arrangement with the EU, and, and it identifies gaps. Uh, and we're trying to address those gaps. And, and unfortunately, Bosnia is lagging behind most when it comes to implementation. But we couldn't say that there has been no progress at all. Uh, some of the countries are more, more progressed, but, but Bosnia is lagging behind due to all these complexities that you have uh, that you have described. Um, and I will leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Petra. Francesca, um, in complementarity, of course, uh, with the European Action Service, the European Commission, especially DG Near, for which we work, um, give more hands and feet to, to, to the policy uh, program. Could you, could you explain a little bit? Also, in reaction to what you heard. Uh, sure, thank you very much. Uh, first, uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, I work uh, in uh, Geneva, uh, the market unit uh, on uh, security and peace, and I'm in the uh, counterterrorism unit. So I work closely with uh, Becca. Uh, I'm privileged to work there. And um, uh, I've also been there because I've uh, been able to, to listen to Martin Boas uh, in person. Because uh, I've been uh, reading his work and also attended uh, one of our seminars in November uh, that we organized on, on the same issue and prevention. Um, and then I, uh, uh, I would like you to, uh, to start by saying that I, I'm also privileged because I, I really would like to endorse what Martin Moore says. I was working previously on Syria, before that Somalia, and before that the Sahel. Actually, I have my still. We always leave a little, little piece of part in this uh, where I've been working. Um, and uh, I have seen this community resistance to radicalization. And actually, uh, we, we were able to remain engaged with funding 
from uh, Virginia in Syria, thanks to this screening of uh, community resistance to uh, uh, radicalization. So in that specific case of Northwest Syria, um, I'm talking about cities like Afghanistan, it was really against the HCS uh, region, uh, uh, groups. Uh, and how we were doing that was that um, by a very uh, brave uh, uh, third party monitors locally that were actually um, reporting back to us. Uh, and then we had other third party monitors that were actually doing spot check certification. So there was finally we found a solution that was, was going to actually that would allow us to take risk in this uh, in this um, in this region, and we were able to remain engaged and to support the population. Can you be more concrete? Uh, we were uh, as soon as uh, the radical groups that took over uh, the uh, northwest Syria in 2017, we were uh, asked to actually withdraw fully and to not leave, not even a euro, a penny of programs there because. Uh, uh, on the basis of the um, uh, what happened to the defeat money when it was still defeat, um, that they, they, it was like Guardian reports saying that uh, I don't know X number of uh, the amount was actually fell in the hand of uh, uh, Jabhat al Nusra. They defeat withdraw and we defeat the, the, the Danish, the Norwegians, all the stabilization monies left. So we were the only one with the German, and, uh, and then the, uh, we were actually doing this accurate monitoring where our money was going. And then when HTS took over, we, uh, our, uh, there was, our line was, we, we leave too, because we cannot risk our tax money money to fell into proscribed groups. And, and uh, the only solution, so those are really like us, like program managers, how can we not leave this? Population behind because we cannot respect, we need to remain engaged. If the, if the risk of creating a battle is much stronger, as I say, let's work on the prevention. And uh, it was, we found that solution so that we have to monitor, we have to, we will engage only in the communities that have shown resistance. And we were using kind of a triangulation of uh, evidence, really, with spot check certification, third party monitoring even beneficiary feedback, or oh, I was working a lot with uh, Syrian women groups, so they were also providing uh, uh, feedback. So we were actually, you know, before engaging, we were providing all this evidence to Brussels, and Brussels would actually give us green light, but yes, go ahead with this point. And then for me, the trick is it's also, <coughs> and of course you are um, faced with a number of challenges. How do you bring your uh, football inside the country? How you uh, you know you cannot bring it's only cash so it was all the, it it was really a, a very difficult and challenging uh, work but we, we managed so it, it was um, just to, to, to verify um, Morton in his uh, opening remarks identified a couple of uh, actors basically uh, that could facilitate you know the non occurrence of uh, of TV. Um, in, in the religious leaders, uh, ruling families, you know, with their lineages, um, intermarriages, uh, you mentioned, or, or those um, responsible indeed for the management of, of resources, lands, and, and water. Is this also what you've seen be most effective as yes. cooperation in, in Syria and uh, Sahel, Somalia, and other yes. places? Yes, yes, all of them is really kind of really context based. So there is no, no one size fits all. Really depends on the community mm -hmm. there. Seriously, it's really important. And then you always have few leaders that are able to, uh, as, you know, uh, drive this process. Uh, in the, and these, if these, these are good leaders, then there is a new community. Um, in, a, in the other case, like Somalia, uh, when I started working with Somalia, there were like several. Uh, the, the, uh, it, it's a bit tricky, but the, the, the women were the one were our uh, leverage against the recruitment, uh, against the recruitment into the Ashabab, and uh, because they were weak, but also into the against the recruitment of pirates. Remember, because mm -hmm. it's a terror. But now 
you know, uh, so let's just Somalia in 2014. Now, what I hear from my previous colleagues is actually the women are so upset in the situation that they are asking the kids to actually go into a Shabbat because this is the only revenue generation modality. So I would actually be very careful. These, so definitely you have to engage in this category of people, always. But you also have to screen carefully because sometimes there are negative events that are positive. And of course, what we were doing is that we were uh, uh, both in Somalia and in Syria. We, we, we were support, uh, supporting not our think tanks uh, and uh, they were providing training on peace mediation, uh, conflict resolution, uh, and this process. And something else that I've learned is first of all, local solutions to local problems, for sure. But also, um, we need to go. Uh, we need to um, allow the communities to get on, on their own feet. We cannot push, we cannot accelerate. And this is a big kind of the donor side. We are always, you know, we have to provide the results. We have to provide, you know, this is our impact. This is our tax money management. But no, we have to allow the communities to acquire their own freedom of this. For instance, now, in a, another example, uh, Somaliland, received a lot, a lot of uh, IDPs from Ethiopia, but also uh, South Central Somalia. And then uh, we had to do a kind of a peace building uh, an impact assessment. So our uh, projects on uh, confidence builder, did they, did they um, uh, provide the results? Like, were they impactful? And, uh, and the, uh, it's really difficult, you know, we, we always face with this, uh, Lack of uh, quantity in terms of you know measuring peace building results, and the consultant came up with uh, for me the striking most striking uh, um, uh, solution um, with the number of uh, IDPs that the Somaliland, given the uh, economic uh, and climate challenges uh, that they, they received, and the fact that they were not conflicts, so they were not means that you have been able to, to, to grow a social fabric and a kind of a resilience. That have actually been able to absorb the shock. And this would be really interesting in Bosnia now, because if we are able to support those examples that you named, this could actually be a um, counter reaction to the uh, influence uh, of Russia. So, what I want to say is that from a donor point of view, we have a very, so we are, you know, we are involved in the neighborhood, uh, in the Western Balkans, we are supporting these joint action plans. Policies, yes, of course, in the MENA region. Uh, but the, the big, um, uh, but the big challenges from a donor point of view, let me be frank on that, is really uh, how can we support those local uh, initiatives uh, by absorbing the risk of because we have to report back to parliaments, to member states. So it's really tricky. Uh, how can we do that uh, constantly? Because we need to really engage with enough money because we, we won't see results soon. You know, this building takes time, time to time. And, um, uh, and also, how can we assure this light touch where the local ownership is always there? Because as you say, it was a bit tricky, like US embassy financing the sport, I know, how, how can we, it has to be locally owned. So they, 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 they should find a way to actually be less financially dependent from its uh, but this is just an example. So we are, this is how we try to combine our response. Um, and I think yeah. So. Yeah, uh, I just want to add this. For example, what uh, was said about how to uh, improve local ownership and uh, so how to um, make uh, this community not depending on uh, um, funding for coming from uh, partners, etc. I want to give an example of in this center of Mali and in Burkina Faso. I think there's two uh, sectors where uh, perhaps we need to focus on this education and livestock. Uh, education, why? Because today there is a kind of big crisis of in IDPs, especially in Burkina Faso. You have kids who have 
school left, uh, their school were closed for like five years now. So meaning that all these kids, if they don't have any, but they might get enrolled uh, in these kind of groups because they don't have any possibility of uh, being a school. So it means that I think there is something to do about this uh, IDP, especially the, the children, the children who are in the IDP camp in Burkina Faso. Regarding livestock, I think there is a, uh, what happened is most of the state, uh, silent states uh, did uh, give a priority to agriculture. Uh, livestock was like a kind of peripheral activity. And if you look at most uh, of the Sahelian population are nomadic people, uh, like Poland is, uh, Morton was just saying that there is a, today there is a kind of amalgam between being Fulani and being Jihadist. So it's meant that if you don't reverse, for example, the policy, the policies regarding livestock, how much money we allocate to livestock for it to reverse them. For example, it gives the possibility of headers or cattle owners to be able to, uh, let's say, produce meat. And, uh, and this has to do also with, we are importing a lot of meat from Europe, from other countries in, this, in these countries. <coughs> And there is a possibility of producing meat. It's the same thing with milk. Uh, we, we are importing a lot of milk powder, for example, uh, instead of promoting uh, for the production of local milk, etc. And these, I think these are some type of uh, solution that need to be investigated, that it can prevent in the long term, the enrollment, and it can be a, strategy of prevention against violence. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for uh, the observations and uh, challenges and questions. Um, the influence of third parties, I mean, it's real. There's no doubt about it. But on the other hand, I, I, uh, um, I will be careful also at exaggerating it. Uh, Russia is trying to have an influence on certain things in, in the Sahel and parts of the Middle East. No doubt about that. But to make the current crisis in the affairs between France, EU, Europe, and countries like Mali and Burkina Faso simply a matter of Russian influence, then we are missing the point here. Uh, have they made some attempts? Yes, most likely. Uh, but the fact that people are not stupid, they know that one way of really sort of, um, uh, pardon the language, uh, pissing off uh, Macron and France and, and Europe is shouting Viva Putin. They understand this. And uh, what I know about the capacity of the, in the Russian embassy in Bamako, I mean, I, they don't understand small at all too much. So I uh, will be careful in sort of yes, they are made. But I mean, there are also other third parties involved there, and we want to understand what is going on, sort of uh, the geopolitics around the Sahel. I mean, you also need to bring in the, the complicated relationship uh, between Algeria and Morocco, which certainly do not contribute uh, much to. Uh, to finding a solution to this conflict. I mean, they need to. Uh, uh, also understand the economic policies of Morocco and uh, how they, they, these uh, their priorities have changed the the end of a state in uh, in uh, Libya. I mean there are numerous third party influences here, um, and to a certain extent you need a regional concert around the the, the Sahel to, to to end these conflicts. Um, unfortunately, that is not going to happen anytime soon. The relationship between Morocco and Algeria is not necessarily uh, becoming any better. It's was, uh, which are more likely is the rocky ride from bad to even worse, and then it becomes a little less bad again, and then it sort of goes down. Uh, Libya is not going to put together anytime soon. 
and uh, Russia will continue to try to do its thing. Wagner is there, uh, no doubt about that. The extent to which Wagner actually will have an impact on this conflict, I doubt it. Uh, and I doubt how long they will be there. There are also really, really, very, very credible rumors that parts of the Wagner force, either who were supposed to go there or, or actually go there, has in fact been pulled back because they are needed in, uh, in, in Ukraine. And how the hell they're going to finance this, I have no idea about because the, the Wagner deal that was made in the Central African Republic, that cannot work in, in Mali. Because we are here, we are not talking about diamonds, we're talking about gold, we're talking about artisanal gold mining. And the artisanal gold fields that the Mali government possibly could give to uh, as a concession to Wagner, they are in mainly in the Liptaka Gurma area, the, the, the areas where there is a lot of jihadi insurgency activity, which means that Wagner will have to fight its way in there and then fight to control these areas and then find young miners that are willing to mine for them, because this is artisanal mining, this is, uh, you know, spade uh, and a shaker, basically, that, they, that they're using. These are not these kind of underground gold deposits. So I think that this will become a financial nightmare for our thing. One more thing, because I see that people uh, want to talk about, but the on these transactional links between these two, yes, they do communicate. But I believe that the level of communication between, for example, the, the Sahel groups and if you would like to call them motherships, I mean, Al Qaeda, it's on a relatively low level. And it's more, they are not op operative branches that takes direct orders from sort of Al Qaeda Central. This is rather more the use of a brand name than anything else. And this may change. There, and here I would just like to point out that one way of also decreasing radicalization would be <coughs> to attempt negotiations. And there is strong support in Mali for negotiations with what they call the Malian jihadi. And here I think that the, the, the approach from France and the European Union should have been somewhat more leaning towards at least attempting this because sooner or later we will have to negotiate. And it's better to negotiate now rather than wait as we did in Afghanistan. Because the problem here is that these guys, they could potentially take down the government, but they cannot take it over as Taliban. And that would create an even worse situation than the one in Afghanistan. No, no, it's great. There's a couple of people who still like to come in, and I'm keen to end uh, on time. Uh, so if we do this in a rapid fire back and forth, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hello, all. I'm uh, Shay Gosa, and I work with uh, ISF uh, and the Public Development Unit, but I'm also an associate researcher with the uh, And I'm from Afghanistan. It was very interesting to see the presentation and also the, the, the discussion. Um, there are a couple of points that I would like to, to mention, and uh, it was very interesting for me some keywords that I took out of the presentation. For example, the, the interactive tolerance. This is what uh, in Afghanistan it is a multi ethnic uh, country, and it has been for years a very strong conflict between these ethnics. And uh, we, we believe, I come not from, from a dominant ethnic, let's say from the one that doesn't have the, the, government, the government now. Um, for years, we, we believe that we could do this uh, through negotiations and through tolerance and through, uh, let's say, interacting with each other. Uh, but at some point, we, like most of us, realize that this interactive tolerance is not in a way working in the country. It is because um, the violence and the extremists and the other ethnicity is as strong and as normalized as it's just something that is being there. I mean, it's normalized in all the roots of society and all the mindsets of society that it is very difficult to, uh, to, to, to make people realize that this is something not normal. And at some point, we really needed to look for another, uh, another solutions. So, so at the moment, the, 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 the problem is that the de facto authorities that are there, um, the extremists are not only supported by this, but they are the de facto authorities now. My, my main question is like, how high the risk 
of this extremist, violent, uh, extremist and radicalism is to affect also not only Afghanistan, but neighboring countries and somehow in Europe through migration to uh, all the channels that could um, that could bring these radical thoughts and strengthen uh, this through the world that, that uh, we could see the risk around. And um, another point is like, um, can you the, formulate that question? I mean, how high? How high the risk of this uh, radicalism is to be spread in the neighboring countries and the region and also in the Europe where we would like to really feel safe and, and, and the society is already in a, um, of course, in a, in a very advanced situation compared to, um, to Afghanistan. And uh, the other point is that uh, when we talk about negotiations with these, uh, uh, with these authorities, um, I'm, I'm also keen to understand how um, there is also a risk to uh, indirectly and uh, to, sorry, uh, unconsciously um, legitimize these groups by engaging with them. And uh, it's very important to see that those that are in the in the power now, and um, for example, claim that they understand and they will open the schools, they will open the risk for education and consolidation or anything. But what is inside those claims? These schools are open, but what is the curriculum? It's all about um, really, really extreme and radical Islamic thoughts that is dangerous not only for the country but for the world. How, how important it is and how could we make sure that um, the third party actors and the EU specifically uh, could strengthen more local organizations and think tanks and not to, um, by engaging with Taliban or, or for example, the extremist group is not strengthening them. Thanks. That's a question for our Norwegian uh, partners, obviously. <laughs> um, Kari, uh, do you like to come in? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Kari Buslan, uh, from uh, Norwegian Institute of National Affairs. Um, I, I have many questions, but uh, given the time, I, I think I will um, just ask one, which is uh, to the EU representatives here. Um, as a researcher, it's quite challenging. I'm involved in, in uh, the project with Mohdi and Adina and Abdul uh, and Stephen. It's challenging to try to find out what the EU in fact is doing in saying that the Hala are in the Balkans. Because you know, if we if we look at, I mean, there is while there is some transparency, it's still not transparency as for, of course, um, how much money is spent on a specific um, area, perhaps. So. And the other difficulty is, of course, also that what is labeled. Um, Preventing violent extremism or counter terrorism, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is on a, that is a very narrow focus, so to speak. While if you want to focus on the non terrorists, the preventive part, then the, the, the budget line would probably be called something else. I mean, education or uh, NGOs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's um, it's a puzzle for us to find out what you know, the EU is doing in these areas in order to focus on the non materials And I wanted just to to raise this as an issue because we might get the picture wrong sometimes because when we ask uh, or look into the budget of the EU, we will get maybe the wrong figures. So I just wanted to to raise it as a challenge for us to understand the picture. Here. And invite yeah. you back to Brussels for a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Gary. Uh, and finally, yeah, um, yes. I have one question as well. So, hi, my name is Aidy Kisitete. I work uh, for Russia Europe, um, but until recently, I was working for the uh, Global Anti Terrorism Forum. Um, so, we launched an initiative um, a couple years ago on fostering national local cooperation. Um, of course, recognizing that this cooperation is really essential to enable context-specific responses to enable donor coordination um, and so on, and of course also enable access to funding. Um, so we held consultations with a lot of states in this regard, but what was found was that many members or many states in general, you know, they don't, the, the whole concept of cooperating with the local level is foreign to them because they adopt these state-centric responses to um, building, uh, to react to, um, to counter terrorism. So my question to you would be how do you deal with these states and how do you convince them to actually work 
and cooperate with the local government. Can I just make one comment while I'm not in there? Let me introduce myself. I'm Bhashpati Mukherjee. I'm a career diplomat from the Indian Foreign Service, and I'm going to be speaking this afternoon on Ukraine and its geopolitical implication. I just wanted to follow up on what my, my young colleague from Afghanistan said, to say that in South Asia, and from India particularly, we do believe that uh, the decision at some point uh, to engage with the Taliban uh, actually, in our view, sent a completely wrong message to the Taliban about the determination of the West to stick to those aspects of their anti-extremism anti program like education for women, um, not pushing women back to the 10th century, et cetera. So when you, when you speak about engaging, which is of course very relevant, one has to engage, one has to take into account that those who are violent ideologies, extremist ideologies, usually take the desire of a reasonable uh, interlocutor who wants to engage as an indication of either his weakness or his ultimate or the ultimate decision which would be to compromise and when the compromise is is reasonable between two reasonable parties that's fine but when one party takes that compromise and then moves it back as has happened in afghanistan uh, you are then especially if you're a neighboring country you're then watching the whole painful process especially for afghan women who thought they had a future and who are now being once again pushed back into the 10th century. So I wanted to bring that to all of you at the table to say that those of us who are in India and there's so many Afghan women have, have come across and, and we see them and uh, their condition. And then it, it, they always say, we had the hopes because the donors came, they said, you have a bright future. And now where are they? So I wanted to leave that for, for a point of observation. Thank Thanks you. very much. Mm -hmm. the next then, uh, yeah, I, I, I really do quite accept how much the grand narratives, master plans, and state politics are matter. Because I quite often find myself that, yes, we work on local level, local communities, and then it's just one statement, neuroerotic world, spoil everything we. Um, at the same time, I'd say that the EU, uh, but also the US and the Western liberal community yes. uh, has a very, over the past um, couple of years, and specifically the last year, has had a very negative um, uh, 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 perception and created a very negative image among the most pro-liberal circles in Bosnia and Herzegovina and in the region. So simply collaborating with um, um, and appeasing, trying to find accommodation with those, uh, let's say, Greater Serbia project to, let's say, not really uh, reacting at all to the narrative of the creation of the Serbian world. This project comes directly from the Serbian government. And the uh, Serbian President Alexander Vucic uh, is treated more or less as a factor of stability. And the West is trying very actively to call him um, against Russia you know, to bring him to the side of the West. Frankly speaking, we in Bosnia are so much afraid how much will co-opting uh, uh, Alexander Vucic to the West, how much it will cost us. Because we've seen in the past that those kind of trade-offs uh, on, 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 on the cost of sovereignty of Bosnia and Herzegovina are always on the table. You know, we've seen certain maps are being uh, um, uh, drawn by some European politicians, even, even, even from Croatia, uh, at the expense of our uh, territory. So I think that the EU and 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 the, and the US they they have to acknowledge really publicly that those 
uh, grant great projects for creating ethnically homogeneous territories are not that. There was a Hague Tribunal. There were judgments. Those policies were condemned, and a number of quite a number of people sit in the prison for it. But the ideology and plans to divide the Bosnian territory is still alive. And Putin has recognized that I think it's time for the European and the EU uh, and the US leaders also to recognize. Because yes, we can work on the prevention and we can work on the local level, but none of it will make sense uh, if, if, if the new war starts in Bosnia. It's actually a nice invitation to, to listen to this afternoon's uh, discussion about uh, the geopolitical implications of the war in Ukraine because this drive towards the geopolitical EU sits in tension, of course, with the conflict sensitivity that tended to be predicated throughout this, uh, this panel. Um, Morten, the, the last word is yours. Thank you. Um... I mean, uh, some complex uh, questions here. I mean, uh, of course, I mean, I, I sympathize with uh, the plight of uh, uh, Afghan women. I mean, I have uh, friends and colleagues in Afghanistan. I have also a picture of Afghanistan with, uh, uh, in the previous process <coughs> with uh, Afghanistan research and their evaluation units. So, I mean, I, I sympathize with that. But that does not mean, and it went wrong in the case of Afghanistan, but I still think that. And an external external actor should at least not put negotiations down as a red line when people in the in the country in question uh, quite overwhelmingly I think want to attempt negotiations. So uh, and in the Sahel, I mean, either we allow these uh, con these conflicts to continue with the consequences that uh, that will have, or we find a solution to them, and that solution is will not be a military level. One needs to find a policy solution. And then I would, my uh, take on it is that it would be better to try no rather than wait another five to 10 years where we are completely worn out by being there. I mean, the Islamic insurgents, they know that they are fighting an, uh, an asymmetrical warfare where the, their victory is basically not to be found on the battlefield and they know it. Their victory is to stay alive and continue to pester uh, the international community with small, small attacks until we get sick and tired of uh, wearing it, of being there. So they just need to survive one day longer than we have the stomach to, to, to be there. And they know this. And that's why we need to find an uh, other, uh, some sort of other sort of solution. On the ethnic relations, I mean, we see this now, unfortunately, in the, particularly in the case of Mali, but I mean, the, this was also very much some of the same situation that we saw in Iraq before uh, the, the coming of that, and that we still see in, in Iraq. I'm very worried about certain recent developments also within, uh, within uh, Iraq. But, and we see it now with the Fulani Dogan issue, for example, uh, and how can we cannot solve this all kind of feuds and conflicts. Again, but we may become better at trying to create an atmosphere that makes it possible for people to start cooperating. Because I mean, you can have a lot of meetings between uh, ethnic groups that have various sort of grievances against each other, but and sort of talk about tolerance and then we should all love each other and hurt each other and so on and so forth. But you need, you need to find these sort of points that can be supported of more functional cooperation between these groups, these kind of groups. Uh, and I think that people need to tend to understand better the local political economies between these groups. Well, what are the resources that they are in conflict over? How can we sort of become better at helping to find some, uh, some ways in which these resources can be better shared? They can be more efficiently shared reducing the conflict level. And it's very often around these kind of local resources. And yes, I mean, as I already alluded to, I mean, some states that we have to work with, they are problematic. And they will continue to be problematic. But I then we sort of say that we will only work with liberal states. And that will polarize the world 
completely. So we need to find a way also of, of engaging with states that have policies that we do not necessarily like. Otherwise, I mean, you can just forget about anything that is called international cooperation. And that means that we need to also, uh, there are certain things we certainly cannot accept. And then there is a lot of things that we just have to accept in order to still have an international community. Because if you end up with an uh, international community of like minded, uh, uh liberal state we end up with an international community of western europe and uh, and the us basically and people should take a look at there is no international coalition behind really uh, the, the stance that the us and europe has uh, taken in ukraine the rest of the world either of to forget all about it they think it's not their war why why should they pay the cost for this and from me, I think it's about time that you have a word about. So, I mean, that is something that we need to keep in mind. But if you allow me 10 seconds to say one last thing, and that is at least what we see with a lot of these people who join these groups in Sahel, North Africa, but also in the Middle East, in fact, is that the rank and file are not necessarily really necessarily <coughs> convinced when they go. They may be socialized into this if they stay within these groups for a long time. But we should not read the reasons uh, what we have seen of, of these kind of ideologies, be it ethno-nationalist, far-right, or the other version, which is then some sort of religious Islamic extremism. I don't think we should read this as neither anti-state nor anti-modernity, but rather a craving for a state that actually works for people. And that means that what people are craving for is not an anti-modernity, but an alternative modernity that actually works for them. And in that, there is some hope of finding solutions to it, because it means that underneath there is not necessarily extremist religious <coughs> beliefs or necessarily extremist xenophobic belief if you look at the other side. But the feeling that the world has passed them by, that there is no place for them in this world. That means that uh, again it goes back to this importance of trying to do something with the non-occurrence, with strengthening the resistance that do exist. Because whether it's ethno-nationalism or it's the uh, opposite to the uh, near deal with uh, most people would prefer not to be engaged with us. And that is what we need to continue to try to strengthen and to understand why. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Morten uh, and Dina. Please do follow um, our Privex websites. Uh, further research will come online. Thank you so much also for uh, your own observations. I thought it was a very enriching uh, discussion, uh, both in identifying some of the pathways, methodologies, uh, the actors uh, to cover. But it remains a, a, a minefield, uh, especially um, with, uh, with these few political tensions that, uh, that, that are uh, flaring up uh, even more. And which we'll discuss this afternoon. Uh, so, a quick pitch uh, in the Food for Thought session in the, in the afternoon. Uh, but lunch is served right now, and at one o'clock, um, we will kick off with the more general uh, plenary uh, conversation. So, looking forward to seeing you there. Thank you for joining us. Now. Sorry, did I? No, no, it's okay. okay.